Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all. Good morning. Good morning. We'll go ahead and set our motivation. Dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki, Rova penche sange drupa sho sange, Judon sogi chunam la, Janchu padu dani capsuchi, Dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki, Rova penche sange drupa sho sange, Judon sogi chunam la, Janchu padu dani Capsuchi, Dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki, Rola penche sange drupa sho. Letting that motivation connect. Okay. So yesterday we were just kind of making friends with the text, kind of understanding the main themes understanding the main psychology. And then once we start to understand the premise, the question becomes, do you agree? If you agree, how do you practice? So if we're really um, having a gentle but sincere discipline with our study, it's really effective. We don't wanna be asking ourselves if we agree or disagree before we've understood. Do you know what I mean? We don't wanna like mush it all together. And then how do I practice when you haven't understood it yet or you're not sure if you agree yet? Yeah, so I think um, the main things are probably coming clear. We got your peacocks, we got your crows, we got your poison, right? We got your wheel of sharp weapons. Um, and the idea is that the enemy is not outside but the enemy is also not you the enemy is self-cherishing and self-grasping, which are symptoms of innate ignorance, which is not our fault, is just an inborn ignorance that can be removed. And that the mind is so beautiful in the fact that it can be trained, that it can be expanded into this fullest potential and that actually like the birthright of this mind is perfection, and by perfection, we don't mean being perfect in the world. We mean having compassion that is uncontrived for everybody spontaneously all the time. Wisdom that is uncontrived, where we know the things, we don't get the confusion. And in that incredibly profound sense of complete omniscience eventually. And that people are people, that bad people, bad people are a result of a series of choices, habits, conditions. Good people are only good people as the result of many causes, conditions, choices, and experiences. And that the hierarchy that we put onto people is a very superficial thing, that at the base, we are the same. And that could be good news or bad news, depending on what you do with it. So I think that the general premise is probably coming clear, especially those of you that have studied a lot, but were there parts that now that you've had time to sit with it that you wanted to ask about? Ways of approaching your own troubles in life. So the next time someone you care about disrespects you or disappoints you, or um, ignores you, or is critical to you, what will you say to yourself <laughs> that will be effective, that will work? The next time you don't like what's going on with your body, or you don't like what's going on with your resources, or you don't like what's going on in your family, what will you say to yourself? First, I've got to catch it. Yeah. <laughs> not first to worry about what I'm going to say to myself. First, I've got to catch it. Yeah. And that's the hard bit. Yeah. Yeah. To, to not just be lost in the story of the moment, to have enough space in any given moment to be able to invite a new kind of thinking to it is huge. Mm. Yeah. Because I'll go off very quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, like that. Yeah. 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 And it's, because it's just more familiar to do it that way, you know? If I but, catch myself, it's always going to be backtracking. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I very rarely catch myself at the beginning. <laughs> I think that, yeah, I mean, you're making a really important point. And I think that even if it's as simple as when you feel agitation, you know that it's an affliction present. And so your actions of body and mind and speech are not going to be effective, centered, kind, compassionate wise. So therefore just stop. So you don't yeah. have to have a plan. Yeah. Oh, here's what I'll say instead. Here's what I'll do instead. Your first plan is just, I feel agitation. Stop. Yeah, I think yeah. that's great. Yeah. yeah. And that's, you know, that's classic Shanti Davis stuff, right? <laughs> like be like a block of wood, which sounds like you're suppressing or denying or pushing mm -hmm. away, but actually it's more like pause. Yep. Yeah. Pause to kind of come back to yourself. Yep. Yeah. So that's a really good point. Yeah, Tanya, go ahead. That this is my responsibility. It's no one's fault, but yeah. it's my responsibility to um, not to respond to it, I suppose, and to respond to it with understanding. Yeah, um, I think it's one of the um, one of the things that um, I learned from from the mind training mm. um, that it's not. Yeah, it's nobody's fault. My but responsibility it's, it's responsibility. to, and, and I can choose how I respond to it. Yeah. Mm. Yep. And, and that distinction, it's a simple distinction to talk about on the surface, but it's profound in terms of your life to think, what if nothing is anybody's fault? Nothing is your fault. Nothing is their fault. It's a coming together of conditions. However, responsibility exists. I have responsibility for my own reactions. People have responsibility for theirs. But we also know that how much responsibility is based on the conditions of the moment. You know, we wouldn't expect a child to have the same amount of responsibility for punching a friend as an adult, you know? So we're also understanding dependent arising. We're understanding context. And at the end of the day, not assessing who has more or less responsibility, just leaving that and saying, what is mine? Because it's actually a more empowered stance and it makes you less of a busybody, <laughs> you know, it makes you less up in everybody's business. It makes le life less stressful. Just how do I deal with my own mind? Yeah. And then if people want yeah, my what... support and advice, I can offer it, but mostly they don't listen unless they're asking. <laughs> Um, and it's um, what is in my um, and in the circle of my control, mm. what is under my control and what other people do is never under my control. But what I do is yep. yeah. we can we are conditions for each other, but how strong a condition we are for each other is very variable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the tools that I tend to use, the first question I tend to ask myself is what's really going on uh -huh. and I step back and, and, that, and then the answer can come from lots of bits of the Dharma training depending on the context and if it's really heavy it's low zhong and yeah. then I ask the same question what is really going on so in other words, I'm trying to get beyond my conditioned responses to see the other person's point of view or see you know it, yeah. it's just I find that very useful yeah Absolutely. And, and I think that one, one thing that we can get into is thinking that we have to know what's going on for someone else. An educated guess all, can work just as well to soften you. Even if you wind up being wrong about what's going on for them, something else is going on for them completely. It doesn't even matter. You just need to think there are reasons and give yourself a few options of what those reasons might be to reconnect to their humanity and yours and you soften. And then you yeah. find out there's a whole other story going on, but you know, it's the same underlying theme, which is they behaved badly because they were suffering, <laughs> right? Everything else was just details, you know? I'm not really looking for an answer, especially. Yeah. I'm just looking for openness and availability yeah. to different things. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. That's really skillful, I think. Uh, yeah, basically what you just said it really helps me just to see the other person's point of view, even though they don't tell me about it, but just even just imagining putting myself in the other person's shoes and it, it just sparks compassion basically almost immediately. If you think that that person might have a lot going on in their life, well, they will have a lot going on in their life. So 
basically that helps me just almost immediately if I lose, you know, if I lose myself somewhere or if I just just don't know how to react. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and that most people are of a similar level of afflictions and suffering to you and every once in a while you'll meet someone who has incredibly strong afflictions someone we might call you know evil or something but no one is evil inherently or someone who is suffering so terribly they can't see anyone else but themselves and that's where we think of like eight verses of thought transformation of Geshe Lungri Tampa and think oh these rare ones oh these rare ones are so dear you know because mostly we interact with people with similar kinds of afflictions and suffering to ourselves so and if you're lucky enough <laughs> to meet a real doozy then your amazing bodhisattva work comes into play because you ask yourself how do i develop compassion when i don't relate when i can't put myself in their shoes i don't understand it's variations of a theme i have a tiny version of whatever's going on for them but i really don't get why they embezzled a lot of money from this charity or something like that, something that you wouldn't do, you don't relate. You know, then you're really asking yourself, how do I access forgiveness without complete understanding? You know, because it's, it's a possibility and it's something that we need to work towards. But if we could at least start with the people in our lives, at least start with the people you like, you know, we're sometimes not even nice to the people we like, let alone all these, you know, strangers and enemies so gently gently yeah, yeah i absolutely agree looking at other people but what helps me most is looking at myself yeah um, why did i get upset uh why was i angry what was going on um was i feeling excluded was i feeling um put down not valued not appreciated uh poor me all of those and um and sometimes also you know the, the yeah that that's that's one point but also this you know why why did somebody embezzle a vast amount of money from charity that you've just mentioned how have i done anything that's even remotely similar and why did i do it yeah. um i haven't embezzled any money from <laughs> now's brenda's confession <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, you know looking at myself of why i react and also what have i done that's even similar yeah and so it, it helps me understand myself, but it also helps me understand other people. Absolutely. Yeah. You're your own experiment or your, your own um, kind of, I don't know, test subject for what the human experience is like, even though not everyone responds the same. Everyone has similar drives. And, and to know that, you know, we're complicated you know, and, and we do weird stuff. And sometimes we don't even know all of our motivations. We know some of them, but at the end of the day, compassion feels a lot like forgiveness. Yeah. And it, it's, it's like you were suffering and you had an affliction. And so you did the wrong thing. The rest is details and somehow to like, let people off the hook without being complacent is so delicate, isn't it? It's such a delicate dance. Yeah. Yeah, thinking about this wheel of sharp weapons returning in terms of karma, you know, I think that for me, I, I, I try to think of it in terms of, okay, this time let's try something different. You know, here's the wheel of sharp weapons returning, which has returned countless times and I've created more of the same and more of the same. Even if I'm not sure the right thing to do, let's try something different. Yeah. If, if the last time I was passive and afraid when someone was critical towards me and I went into a whole kind of sooky attachment, needy, sad place, this time I'm gonna try to be brave and loving and just say what I see and say what I feel and just let it land and see what happens. May or may not work. Next time I might go bring in a friend. Next time I might do this. Next time I might do that. And at the end of the day, even if everything fails, it doesn't have to be a failure of my practice because the practice is how do I meet each circumstance with an open heart? Because we can't control the world completely or even a little bit or even our own mind very much, but tiny little bits of it 
bring in more peace. And you have to know what a benefit you are to your friends and family when you're in a good space. The ripple effect you create around yourself. Some, sometimes we talk about all sentient beings, all sentient beings, and we feel, yes, of course, I want to be of benefit to all sentient beings, but I don't know all of them. I might have once, but I don't remember their names. You know, I don't know who they are now. And it, it feels a little bit abstract. But if you can think, what about my best friend? What about my dear old mom? What about whoever, whoever? You know, one specific relationship in your life where you know you want to have compassion for them and love comes very easily. Just pick one and then think, all right, that feeling I have between us where I really care for them, I really want to forgive them, I really want the best for them in such a genuine heartfelt way, take that and expand it. You know, so sometimes we start with the expanse of all sentient beings and try and make it feel visceral and real and let it touch our heart and then come into our everyday relationships. But sometimes it, it works to start with your everyday relationships and then expand outward. So do which direction feels like it's gonna work for you for it to be genuine. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, we looked at the main themes. So we have peacocks being bodhisattvas, analogous to bodhisattvas, poison analogous to the danger of living in a samsaric environment with samsaric views meaning really that samsara is us, our five aggregates. Crows, analogous to us as being cowardly beings motivated by self-cherishing and self-grasping. The wheel of sharp weapons being analogous to karma. Yama and yamantaka, karma and disturbing emotions and the wisdom that destroys them. Okay, and so this is under the genre of mind training, lojong thought transformation which emphasizes Tonglen practice, this giving and taking practice, which develops bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is the direct antidote to self-cherishing. So there's a lot of different ways of formulating this structure of getting yourself to Tonglen or getting yourself over self-cherishing and into cherishing others. We looked at these first four. We haven't looked at number five yet. In the first four, when you're identifying self-cherishing, do you have any questions? Do you feel like you can experience what you're like when you're strongly under the influence of self-cherishing or is it still a little bit confused? Is that point clear, what self-cherishing is? Yeah, that it's not just practical looking after yourself, that it's excessive self-focus. But it's, and we might call it selfish self-concern, selfishness, self-centeredness, narrow focus, whatever, but it's more than that. Yeah, it's, it's something that's underlying even our good actions when we're being kind. I was just thinking yeah. about uh, an aspect of self-cherishing. I got, I, personally, I got straight into it yesterday, straight after this had finished, which was all the rubbish about, well, some truth too that I'm a bad person, I'm not good enough, I'm selfish. And I was just thinking, well, there could also be a problem of spending, you know, basically if my partner had been home or I'd have, I don't know, I'd have had something planned to do for other people, they wouldn't have come up. But uh, I know that's a form of self-cherishing and it's a habit to think like yeah. that. But it's also, it's also very painful and it also takes away from the ability to give to others because it, personally, it's like to run down. So. Yeah, that aspect of self-cherishing is, I'm sure I'm, I know I'm not alone in that, but it's something to watch out for. I think but there's a saying or something like when you're with others, watch your speech when you're with own, your own, when you're on your own, watch your mind. Yeah. So, so maybe something about that. So when, say when teaching is over, you've been really part of something and positive and then suddenly you're on your own and then all the opposite, opposite thoughts sort of come back. I'm not good enough and I'm selfish and I'm too self-centered. All yeah, rubbish. and truth as well. Yeah. yeah, that one is so tricky because it doesn't feel like self cherishing. It feels like self loathing, you know, and you think, oh, I don't have self cherishing. I don't like myself. How could that be self cherishing? But it, you're, you're quite right. It is self cherishing. It's, it's that imploded, narrow focus of everything's about me. And it's also related to pride. You're not good enough. What do you mean? Good enough for what? something that you think you should be capable of or a way you think of yourself as 
and your performance is not matching up. And the tension of that then sends you into despair. But if you'd had an accurate sense of your own capabilities in this moment, you wouldn't be disappointed, <laughs> you know? And where you are at at this moment is completely fine, right? It's completely workable, completely useful, completely of benefit in this world. It's just that your pride took a snapshot of yourself on a really, really good day when all the conditions were perfect. And now you say, that's me, that one that performs at maximum capacity, that efficient, wonderful, kind, patient, grounded, wise one that I was that one time five years ago on a really good day when the weather was nice and I was eating properly. That's me. <laughs> so then every time you don't live up to that one day, you're disappointed in yourself. But that was a really good day. That wasn't how you are all the time. Someday it will be how you are all the time and that will be your baseline. And then you'll have a higher good day you know, and it'll progress and progress. But it's really is important to look at the role of self-loathing in self-cherishing because it's harder to catch and it is so painful. Like it just, you know, it's like a knife in the heart. You face just think I'm so bad, I'm useless. You know, I'm good for nothing. Everyone would be better off without me. I just, you know, sit around consuming resources, breathing air, drinking water that I'm not even worthy of. You know, you just go into a whole vortex of doom, like it's horrible. And advice one of my friends gave me when I was in my sort of angsty early 20s. Did everyone have an angsty early 20s? Yeah. Anyway, angsty early 20s. Um, <laughs> I had a friend who said to me a very profound thing. She said, don't examine the puddle while you're in the puddle. Yes, wait until you're out of the puddle and reflect on it, how you got there, what you said to yourself, the way it was nonsense, the way a, that you got yourself all kind of sooky and self-absorbed. But don't do that when you're in it, because when you're in it, you'll just find more reasons to reinforce it, won't you? Yeah. And so now we're all grown up, right? But we still can slip into that very easily if we're stressed, if we're tired, if we've been doing maybe even Dharma work in a very deep way, but maybe pushing a little bit or bringing an intensity to it that was maybe a bit much. And what we needed to do afterwards was just something very spacious and light and grounding, you know, but, but, you know, life is not so tidy like that. So sometimes you, you know, go from a stressful or sort of a energetically stimulating situation to another one and you needed more recovery time. And without that, you kind of slid into some sort of spiral. It's so natural. It's so human. So looking at self-loathing from a lot of perspectives of self-loathing is not humility. Self-loathing is not modesty. And self-loathing is not kind of moving you along the path to enlightenment. It's actually, in a way, akin to guilt, which says, if I feel bad about myself, that's the price I pay to not have to change. Yeah, I'll, I'll give myself permission not to change as so long as I feel really bad about it. That's the, that's the, the how I pay for it, yeah? So it's okay. <laughs> as long as I feel bad about myself, it's okay. Do, do you know that weird logic we can get into with guilt and self-loathing? And it's nonsense and it's not Tibetan Buddhism at all, but we kind of bring it in from the way we've been brought up. So regret, excellent motivating, empowering. Regret says, I have Buddha nature. I can do better than this. I need more conditions and mindfulness. Next. Guilt says, I am bad. I did a bad thing that says something primordial about me and I'll just keep whip whipping myself to make up for it. But I don't have to change. I'll just whip myself, <laughs> you know? So knowing the distinction between guilt and regret, the distinction between humility and self-loathing so important for us and it just requires some time sitting with yourself but you can tell the difference once again with the level of agitation humility feels very spacious and relaxed and curious like there's no pressure for you to know everything there's no pressure for you to be everything you're but you have a sense of your own potentiality which really is very much giving you confidence, yeah? You have confidence in your ability to progress with enough information and support, yeah? But you know that you don't have it yet, so you're humble and open and spacious. So humility is relaxed. Self-loathing is either tight 
or heavy. Yeah, it's got a really visceral physical quality of stagnation or agitation, depending on your personality, where you become very, very busy with tasks that don't really matter to distract yourself from your feelings of self-loathing, or you become paralyzed and don't do anything at all and kind of curl up in a ball. Do you relate to one of those versions? Yeah. <laughs> so knowing how, how are you when you're happy, open, humble, beginner's mind, as opposed to when you're self-loathing, you know, afflicted, pride, weirdness, self-cherishing. Because they might look the same on the surface, but they feel totally different. And other people will respond to you very differently. Yeah. You'll notice like someone like His Holiness is very, very humble, but totally confident. That, that's what we're aiming towards. Humble, but confident. Yeah, yeah thanks for bringing that up, Judy. So, so when we decide to actually exchange self for others, we, we do this Tonglen practice. So this Tonglen practice uh, comes up again and again, but in the verses, we kind of get the invitation starting with verse seven. So it says, uncontrollable wandering through rounds of existence is caused by our grasping at egos as real. This ignorant attitude heralds the demon of selfish concern for our welfare alone. We seek some security for our own egos. We want only pleasure and shun any pain. But now we must banish all selfish compulsion and gladly take hardship for all others' sake. So this verse really has a lot. The first sentence is basically explaining to us how samsara works. It's uncontrollable at our level because we grasp at egos as real, meaning we have self-grasping, viewing the self in our own mental continuum, holding it to exist inherently. Yeah, so that's what makes it uncontrollable. But once we pierce through that, and see the wisdom of the emptiness of inherent existence, then it won't be uncontrollable. So then the second sentence, this ignorant attitude, right? This self-grasping ignorance heralds or invites or opens the door to the demon of selfish concern, self-cherishing. So because you have self-grasping, that opens the door for self-cherishing which says, me first, me first, me first. And I want only pleasure and I can't bear any pain. And what's more, I'm entitled to pleasure and I'm entitled to be free from pain. And it's all about me. So then the conclusion is, but now, now that we've met the Bodhisattva path, now that we're more mature spiritual practitioners, we must banish all selfish compulsion and gladly take hardship for all others' sake. So to take hardship for all others' sake means a lot of things. There's a lot of angles you can bring to that last bit. So take hardship. So first of all, your own hardships, meeting them with some sort of grace, meeting them with some sort of patience, meeting them with practice means you don't inflict the pain of that hardship onto other people that you're with. So just on a basic level, it's, you know, being very conscious of the fact that you don't want to leak <laughs> or spread or be contagious with your hardship. Do you know what I mean? So like, say, you know, you have something as simple as a headache. If you have a headache and take on that hardship gladly, then you think, oh, wow, okay, I have negative karma ripening. If I manage it with patience and kindness, it finishes, it exhausts, that seed is done, and I don't create any more negative karma of that type. But also, if I don't give in to the habit that says, pain gives you permission to be grumpy. <laughs> yeah, if you stop that relationship and say, pain is pain, grumpiness is grumpiness. They don't have to be best friends. They are two separate things. Yes, so I will not inflict the grumpiness on my family just because I have a headache. But I'm also not going to be a martyr and say, oh, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, you'll say to your family practical things like, hey, guys, can you turn down the music? I've got a headache. But, you know, not in a mean way, just in a kind of letting people know. Yeah, 
putting it out there, but not heavy, oppressive, and you're not leaking your hardship. So you're gladly taking on the hardship that gladly, it, you just have to really sit with what that would look like for you. But when you meet hardship and you have enough mental space to not give in to an affliction, it actually makes you feel very strong. It makes you feel really courageous. You think, I'm not giving in to this pain and letting it turn into attachment, anger, or ignorance. I'm not giving in. It makes you feel like I am triumphant over the suffering. Yeah, it really gives you a sense of, of confidence. And of course, the certain amount of pain is too much for us to bear without going into something. But we gradually build our capacity by starting small. Yeah, that quick question on that one, well, for advice really, because I find that that's okay with, with looking back at various things that I've had to deal with. Um, I find that okay, managing to sort of look at it that way. What I struggle with, especially with people close to me, yeah. when they're suffering and it all gets dumped on me how I then deal with that because that to me then is turning it around and that's what presses my buttons as opposed to my own difficulties yeah yeah you're like I'm yeah. managing my you know own I mean? stuff <laughs> you deal with yours <laughs> so that's the challenge for me you know when um yeah yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and the verse is definitely in the commentaries, it's related to that direction too. And that is the um, next level work, right? That is the hardest work because it is again, that dance of you don't need to accept bad behavior. You don't need to, to say it's fine for you to treat me this way. But what you're doing is you're saying, I actually don't have to react the way I always reacted. You know, and we all have different triggers. Like some of us get triggered if we feel disempowered and disrespected some of us don't mind it rolls right off we remember the quote from Eleanor Roosevelt who said no one can make you feel inferior without your consent right <laughs> or something like that right so we might have another trigger which is oh they're they're in a lot of pain they're struggling and they expect me to solve it for them they want me to be the fixer the advice giver the problem solver you know and why don't they take responsibility and you know pull their socks up and get on with it right? Or I don't have time to, or what if I can't, or that's too much pressure, or whatever. You feel the trigger of, because they expect me to help, then I have to, in the way that they expect. Because I identify as a helpful person, you know, and that's why there's the trigger, because you identify as the helpful person. And, you know, if you can say, I'm helpful contextually, <laughs> contextually, sometimes when the things come together, you know, and if someone is putting that on you because they have that expectation, which might be an expectation built over years of having seen you solve problems, you know, so then it feels heavier because sometimes it's true. You really do save the day still to be able to wear it where they may respond badly. And that doesn't mean I'm bad. They may respond badly. It doesn't mean I've failed them. You know, and somehow to make peace with the reactions you don't want them to have, because the reactions you don't want them to have, it seems like it's because you don't want them to suffer. But there's also the self-cherishing that says, I don't want them to be mad at me. I don't want them to not like me. I don't want them to think less of me. That is self-cherishing. Yeah. And so it's like, your ego dances and says, no, 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 I don't want it to happen that way because I don't want them to suffer. I don't want them to suffer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, but why do you want, not want them to suffer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it bounces back. back. Or, That's another yeah. boomerang. <laughs> yeah, and you, you, you know, you probably go back and forth between the right motivation and the wrong motivation. Oh yeah, it's, it's exhausting. Then. Yeah, <laughs> but you hit it on the head and really helpful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, humanity. <laughs> Darn humanity. So to take on hardship for all others' sake. It's, it's like, what is for all other sake? The first step is don't add your delusions, suffering and, and you know, all the mess, don't add to the situation. You know, first step is pause, right? Don't add. And then the second step is, is there a way I can be big enough to make it better? Some days you can, some days you can't. But try and remember, when someone has been compassionate towards you, when you were going through a rough spot. Yeah, 
Okay, so, so really think like there was a time when you were really agitated and afflicted and not totally on track. It's embarrassing to remember moments like that, but we all have them. Every once in a while, someone meets you it, at a bad spot and they bring compassion to you. What does that look like and feel like? What does it open the door to? When someone comes towards you and your suffering and your afflictions with compassion, they're not blaming you for not being your best. They're not pressuring you to get over it now. And they're actually holding the truth of your pain and your suffering together with the truth of your potentiality, right? The truth of the fact that you are not your suffering, the fact that you have the potential to be free of that suffering. So sometimes when it's like sympathy or empathy, it's just like being with the suffering and wanting them to be free of it, but not really believing that freedom is possible anytime soon because you're just kind of lost in the moment of the drama. And that's why sympathy and empathy turn into empathic distress and what pop psychology calls compassion fatigue. But there's no such thing as compassion fatigue if it's actually compassion. Absolutely, there's empathic distress and burnout, absolutely. But compassion sees the potential for freedom, which means seeing the suffering is not so heavy. You can see the suffering because you know it's not the whole story, so it doesn't oppress you to look at it. Does that make sense? So compassion is wishing all others to be free from their suffering. When come, you see the suffering, you see the freedom, potentiality, both. So someone comes towards you with compassion, with that kind of a vibe, and it feels like they respect you, yeah, even though they see you at your worst. They're respecting the fact that they know that you can move through this. They know that you're better than this. They know this isn't always you. They're holding the truth of that while holding the fact that you're going through a rough time and they really have a lot of care for you. The two together, right? It's a, it's a whole different thing than just someone like pitying you, which is like, oh, you're suffering, you poor thing, pat, 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 which is like condescending and patronizing and you feel crap afterwards. Or empathy, which feels nice and feels connected, but doesn't really necessarily help. Yeah, it's just kind of soothing in the moment. Compassion can actually give you the space to move through your suffering more quickly. So to gladly take on hardship for others' sake can have all these different layers where if someone's in a bad way, you become the compassionate person that says, I'm not gonna hold a grudge about this moment. I'm not gonna store ammunition later for when they're mean to me and remind them of their weakness in this moment. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not going to expect them to be better than this because sometimes they have been. I'm not gonna hold them to an impossible standard because they're struggling in this moment. So I'm gonna see their mess. I'm not gonna shy away from their mess. I'm not gonna disassociate or ignore the fact that they're a mess, but I'm not gonna think they are mess. They are someone with consciousness that can develop into enlightenment. That's who they are. Yeah, merely labeled on a collection of parts, but those parts are workable parts. Yes. So you're holding that and then it doesn't bother you to see the chaos. And it means that they don't feel the pressure to perform some sort of like health that they're not ready to have. They don't feel like they need to prove that they're not their worst moment. They feel forgiven, they feel free, and they can just move through the moment and the drama doesn't have to carry on for days and months and years. Yeah, people can feel it if you're ready to hold a grudge, even if you're being nice in the moment. Yeah, and then after the whole kind of drama has subsided, that person who was struggling is gonna feel the cringe and the embarrassment of having been seen at their worst or weak. And then later they're gonna be all kind of defensive and weird and you know, you know how it goes. You know how you are, yeah. So kind of to be big enough to be in that like peacock mindset that can just see many things simultaneously without reactivity is such a kindness to humanity. Yeah. So to gladly take on hardships, it means when someone's behaving badly or in a suffering way, part of you 
is happy for the chance to practice deeply, even though you don't want them to suffer and you're not a weird masochist or something, right? You know, but part of you is happy for an opportunity for deeper practice. You think, oh, right, this is a bit more dramatic than usual. Here's my chance to upgrade. Here's my chance to really put into practice the things that I'm learning. Let's see if I can, yeah. in a kind of spacious experimental way, with humor if you fail, yeah. This, the next first is all of our suffering derived from our habits of selfish delusions that we heed and act out. So we believe our own delusions and then we act from them. All of us share in this tragic misfortune. Yeah, all of us share in this tragic misfortune, which stems from our narrow and self-centered ways. We must take all our sufferings and the miseries of others and smother our wishes of selfish concern. And so smother our wishes of selfish concern is very dangerous for Westerners to hear. So what not to think is I should suppress or deny my emotions. Do not think that. <laughs> Yeah, or I should accept bad behavior from others. Do not think that. To smother our wishes of selfish concern is kind of to take all of the suffering as um, a blanket to put out the fire. Yeah, to kind of go whoof, to kill the fire, the fire of our attachment, for example, so that it no longer has any fuel to keep going. So smothering it in that way to dampen something that could get out of control to rob it of air and light that could make it stronger, not to squash ourselves. Yeah, so this word smother can be read in the wrong way. So it's important to remember it's not about suppression or denial. Um, have, you, have you guys heard about the term spiritual bypassing? Thumbs up, nods, most of you, not all of you. Yeah, maybe half. So this is what's being spoken about here is that just because you know what the practice is pointing to and you know you want to get to what the practice is pointing to doesn't mean you're already there. So to acknowledge when you have anger, attachment, hatred, jealousy, pride, all the things, all the mess, or when you have pain, suffering, physical or mental, you can't just immediately race to what you're supposed to think about it or you're bypassing the reality of the moment and you actually miss the power of the lesson. So the trick is, is to spend a few beats, a few moments being with what is going on with me, not trying to change what is going on with you. Don't change it yet, change it in a minute, in a minute. Just cause you know where you're going doesn't mean you can go there yet. Yeah, what am I feeling? I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling irritable. This is what I'm feeling. My body is tense, my mind is racing, or my mind is blank, whatever your style is. Here's what's happening, okay. And then you give yourself enough mental space to say, what is the mind training way to think about this so that it's useful? So it takes a lot of mental spaciousness and maturity to be able to look at what's going on with you without that turning into an exercise of justification. Yeah, to say, well, it's only fair that I feel this way. Look at what happened. It's only right that I feel this way. Look what they did. It's like, yeah, that's true. You know that. Right now, just be with what's going on for you. Justified or unjustified isn't really even the point. Let's just look at what we're working with. Do you see the difference, right? You're just looking at, here's what we're working with. Not whether it's right or wrong or justified or not. Here's what you're working with. How do you work with that? Then you move to the actual practice. So what we can do as Dharma students is say, oh, anger bad, I'm not angry. Yes, you are. <laughs> Take a moment, acknowledge it, <laughs> right? So when we're saying smother, we're saying don't add fuel. Yeah, does it make sense? So we don't wanna do spiritual bypassing, which bypasses the moment of our afflictions and our suffering and races to the end and gets into, oh, it's all good, it's all good, when you're like, you know, squashing all the pain and then giving yourself cancer or something, right? So just don't do that. Give yourself a panic attack eventually or some sort of breakdown or burnout if you keep doing that, it doesn't work. 
And it also makes you harder to be around when other people are struggling because you can spiritual bypass them as well and be like, oh, oh, I know it's hard. I know it's hard, but remember karma. Oh, I know it's hard, but remember enlightenment, you know, and they're just like, oh my God, shut up. I'm having a moment, <laughs> right? Just give me a hug and a glass of water, <laughs> you know? So um, be with yourself without indulging. Be with yourself without skipping. And so then we have, with all the sufferings that others experience, smother completely our selfish concern. The sufferings of others arise from five poisons. Thus, whichever delusion afflicts other beings, take it to smother delusions of self. So what to think is, I can use this. I can use the suffering, delusions, and bad behavior of others as a means to overcome my own. This will actually help me to prevent my future bad behavior and suffering. Yeah, this will actually help me. So five poisons, you got your classics, right? You have um, anger, attachment, ignorance, jealousy, pride, or if we're talking um, in a different list or categorization, instead you have doubt and wrong views depending on your list, but you always have the three main poisons, anger, attachment, ignorance. So what you're saying is we all have these. Yeah, I don't think you're better or worse than anyone else. We all have these, it's versions of a theme. So whatever delusion is afflicting other beings, take it to smother delusions in ourself. So you're saying, all right, what is this person showing me? Which affliction is it? Not whether it's justified or unjustified, just what are they showing me? You know, you're going to the grocery store, the cashier is grumpy and dismissive, okay? Grumpy, dismissive cashier, they're having a bad day. And you think, but I'm smiling. I said, good morning. I looked at them in the eye. I was respecting them and their profession and their humanity. Why did they not smile at me? Ah, they were having anger. I was having pride and entitlement. Hmm, okay, that's what happened just then. That's interesting. Yeah, and so, you know, it's just a quiet conversation in your head, but you think, all right, I'm gonna not let their affliction trigger mine further. I'm gonna meet their affliction with compassion and respect for them. I'm gonna meet it differently. And I'll use that to smother the potential for my little pride, entitlement, attachment thing to pop up the way it normally would. The I was nice to you, why weren't you nice to me? You know, that humph that you get. Yeah, so you're meeting their affliction differently and you're even happy to do so. So really, I mean, I know that's a silly small example, but take those silly small examples because it builds your strength. You're like a weightlifter. You can't just start with the heaviest weight. You have to start small and gradually build up. And if we're running errands and we're in a bad space, a little interaction like that can ruin the next hour and a half or the rest of the day, can't it? It can hit you, you know? And is it their fault that it went in so deep? Did they even want it to go in so deep? Did they even notice that it affected you? Probably not, right? Like often we feel wounded by people that didn't even intend to wound us. They were going through their own thing. And yet now we're carrying it the rest of the day and we're all offended, you know? So the Bodhisattva is really training in, don't take it personally, even if it's personal. They're really training in, to be offended is not standing up for yourself. It's not having dignity. To be offended is to be reactive and to be self-centered. Yeah. We sometimes feel like we have to be offended because we need to preserve our dignity and our sense of self and uh, something. No, <laughs> right? Dignity is remaining unreactive and not getting triggered, having some sort of grace, yeah? So just take the little ones, you know, make your errands, your project, say, how can I stay friendly the whole day? And then of course, what happens on those days when you run errands and you're really practicing the whole time that you're running your errands is that you have all these lovely interactions with strangers and you think, but I was all ready to practice. Where were the grumpy ones? You know, and of course, because you came to people with such positive conditions, you wind up meeting only nice people. Oh, well, <laughs> right? But you might get a tricky one. Yeah, Anne, go ahead. One of the big things that I really struggle with is when things have already been happening for a long time. The patterns are very ingrained. 
And even though I recognize where they're coming from, I don't do it anymore. I don't, I've still got the old patterns coming up. I know purification, I, but yeah. any advice on that, I'd be grateful to receive. <laughs> I feel like you may be referring to family. <laughs> no. <laughs> or old friends, family or old friends, when the, when the dynamics established, right? Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, that's really tough. Because also, even if you are really transforming and really deepening, sometimes they resent that. They want you the way you were, or they feel patronized and that you're being condescending. And maybe you are, who knows? But even if you're not, sometimes people don't like it when you change. So uh, there's a lot of things going on with old dynamics. And I think that you have to kind of take your toolbox to each moment and not preempt it too much with here's what I'll do next time. More think here's how I'll be next time. Because I think we really do want a plan of action. I'll say this, I'll do that. But that actually can kind of collapse the creativity of the moment. What you want to say is the way I want to be is compassionate and wise. So the next time I know I might enter into one of these old family dynamics or old friendship dynamics or spousal things or whatever, I'm gonna ground myself first. I'm gonna set my motivation first. And I'm a big fan of a five minute meditation in the car <laughs> before I get out, yeah? Once I've parked, right? Once I've parked, five minute meditation in the car to just, especially with family, <laughs> right? Just get centered, get grounded then open the door. There's no rule that says you have to jump out of the car the second you park. Yeah, you know. Or... I, I, for me, it's not even that so much because in a way I've sort of on the way with that. Yeah. It's more the thought patterns. It's mm. my internal reactions to certain things. For instance, I know I carry a lot of guilt. I know it's old. I've yeah. been through it loads and loads of times, but there's still such a lot of work to do there. And it's my inbuilt habit reactions mentally does yeah. that make sense yeah yeah and i mean in that case in that case it's more like you just need a circuit breaker yeah it's like you it's a habit it'll keep coming up for quite some time but you have enough space and perspective to know it's not true right but to be able to interrupt it before it gets ahead of steam and you start believing it again yeah because there's like a moment in time where it like starts firing up where part of you has enough new wisdom to know better. But if you don't catch it in that moment, it gets going and gets going and then you start believing it again and there it is again and then it's stuck again and it's gotta play out. So the mindfulness that we try to practice in the Mahayana is not a passive mindfulness. It's not a, what am I doing mindfulness? It's a mindfulness with an agenda and the agenda is bodhicitta. So, here I am walking, doing dishes, typing emails, whatever. I know what I'm doing while I'm doing it, but that mindfulness is not enough. That's enough to develop focus, which is great. But what I want is, and is it staying in alignment with bodhicitta? Yeah, here's what I'm doing. Is it, got a, is it qualified by or imbued with bodhicitta? And if not, then just wake it up, you know, just wake up the bodhicitta and say, the purpose of my life is, yeah, to free all sentient beings from suffering and bring them the happiness of enlightenment. I am included in all sentient beings. <laughs> yes, it's not all sentient beings except me, right? You're included. So you just kind of like wake up that bodhicitta every time you have your mindfulness woken up. Always keep them together. Yeah, circuit breaker, that little sucker before it gets ahead of steam. Yeah, yeah, sometimes those are the most embarrassing ones when you already know better, but here it is again. So I certainly sympathize. So the point of all this is it's workable, it's usable. Yeah, so therefore practice Tonglen. Therefore practice Tonglen. And we'll do Tonglen after we have a little short break. But basically the way it will go is we've already done these first four. We might do them in a very abbreviated way and then go into the Tonglen. So you connect with giving on the out breath. You can visualize golden light or white light, but the essence is connect with compassion, or excuse me, connect with loving kindness. So you're offering your past, present, and future happiness. When you connect with taking on the in breath, you visualize black smoke or black light, something you do not want, 
riding on the in-breath, and you connect with compassion, taking the past, present, and future suffering of yourself and all sentient beings. So loving kindness is wishing others happiness. Compassion is wishing others freedom from suffering. So if you're new to this practice, you can keep it very simple that way, yeah? Um, if you're not as new to this practice, you can layer in more things. So the first level is just in-breath compassion, out-breath loving kindness. In-breath compassion, out-breath loving kindness. Simple, yeah? And if you forget which is which, you just pause for a second and go in, oh, wishing others happiness. Out, oh, wishing them free from suffering. Okay, in loving, in compassion, out loving kindness. Yeah, and then you get used to it. And then you layer in what that means is, I am taking all of my own present and future suffering and deciding to not give into it and let it turn into a negative state of mind or a behavior. I'm actually gonna take it, give it to the self-cherishing thought where it came from, weakening it. I'm going to give all of my own happiness, all of my roots of virtue, all of my good karma out to all sentient beings which sounds very altruistic and selfless, but the reality is all of our good karma came from learning and interaction with sentient beings. Our happiness came from sentient beings, give it back to sentient beings. Yeah. So you start with yourself and then you move to, okay, who's in my life going through a struggle? Yeah, you think, okay, that friend with their financial issue, that friend with their divorce, that friend with their COVID, whatever. And you think, instead of being reactive to their suffering and feeling like I need to fix it or manage it or be the perfect friend and having a whole identity trip, rather than avoiding them, rather than getting mad at them for not dealing with it better, rather than being reactive to their pain, rather than being reacted to their negative states of mind and their behaviors, I'm gonna take it and heap it all on the very self-cherishing that would block my heart towards them. Does that make sense? Yeah, so self-cherishing is what you're giving the black smoke, heavy black light, whatever gunk visualization you like, taking it in, but you're not giving it to your good kind heart, you're giving it to self-cherishing, smothering it, yeah, weakening it. And it is counterintuitive and it doesn't sound like a good idea, right? It sounds like, why would I visualize this? breathing in black smoke? Oh, because you don't want to. That's the very point. Yeah, so you're overcoming resistance. So you do for yourself, friends and family, then places in the world that you know are going through a struggle, you know, forest fires and floods and wars and, you know, poverty, et cetera, all the things. And then all sentient beings, all species, whole universe. Yeah, so you gradually do like that. So we'll um, have a about a 15 minute break. Is that okay? And then come back and do the meditation. <laughs> 